Okay, this video is where do mitochondria come from and why does it matter? Mitochondria are super important. They're the energy of life. They're fragile in many ways and there's a lot of mitochondrial toxins out there. So understanding a little bit about their origin will help you to understand the physiology of cancer and the immune system and some other things, So and the brain. So we'll go through this real quick. In order to understand mitochondria, you have to know a little bit about the origin of life. So just starting with the first picture here, this is God creating the sun and the earth by Michelangelo. Okay, then life on earth was not initially present. It's thought that when he made the sun, it was so hot that you couldn't wait till later to create life. So supposedly life started around, let's just say around 3 billion years ago. It was initially anaerobic, meaning without oxygen. Later, photosynthesis developed and oxygen was released into the air. The initial availability of oxygen was intermittent. That's a key word, intermittent and variable such that cells that were now developing the ability to use oxygen for uh, oxidative metabolism, it's called metabolism with oxygen to make energy, ATP and mitochondria, they weren't at first around. And then later they came around, but the cell would still have a backup mechanism to run on anaerobic glycolysis in case oxygen wasn't readily available. So that's a real important point. Oxygen was not always available in the early beginnings of life on Earth. Okay, just real quick, what is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis means that a plant will take in carbon dioxide, that's CO2, the gray here stands for carbon, the red's for oxygen, CO2, and that provides a carbon skeleton, and then it gets energy from the sunlight, and then it gets water to get H2O. If you think about making a carbohydrate, a carbohydrate is carbo for carbon, hydrate for water. You just attach water to a carbon. That's what a carbohydrate is. And then to make a sugar, a sugar is basically carbons, hydrogens, and uh, oxygens. And that's how you make a sugar. And that's what plants do. They make glucose. That's what the reaction of photosynthesis is. Um, they then give off oxygen. So the two red circles are oxygen. And that's what photosynthesis is about. And then we talked about the timeline for photosynthesis, how um, it didn't happen at first, and then it gradually oxygen became more available in the atmosphere. Okay, now here's really an important slide. This is endosymbiosis. So endosymbiosis means that uh, gradually uh, mitochondria became available. And the mitochondria was an independent living bacteria. And then one day, a big bacteria uh, ate a mitochondria. We call this phagocytosis. This lady, by the way, Lynn Margulis, was a brilliant scientist, and she's the one who pioneered this theory of endosymbiosis. And so endosymbiosis, endo meaning, means inside. Symbiosis means mutually beneficial. So a bacteria, a big bacteria engulfed a little mitochondria. By the, word, by the way, the word is phagocytosis, uh, which just means to eat another cell. And typically when something is phagocytized, it gets degraded by enzymes and eaten by the bacteria that had eaten the other smaller thing. But in this particular case, the mitochondria survived inside the other bigger bacteria. And the mitochondria was producing a lot of ATP and the bigger bacteria got the benefit of that energy becoming more available to it. So they'd had a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. The big bacteria could phagocytize other particles of food and provided a protective environment and a stable environment for the, uh, for the mitochondria. So then when this replicated, they were able to replicate simultaneously and that has led to mitochondria being present in all your multicellular organisms since that time. So it's a rather amazing thing, but that's how mitochondria became available, okay? And this history of oxygen being only available on an intermittent basis and the original bacteria being able to switch back to anaerobic metabolism when necessary is a key point about life on Earth and how cells work. Okay, once Mitochondria were available. You could develop bigger and bigger organisms, multicellular organisms. This is just a painting of God creating the animals by Tintoretto from 1553. He's the Venetian painter. You can tell by the way he uses color. Here, of course, is the painting of the creation of Adam. Um, 
that man was created in the image of God, and I think that's Eve right there, and this is from the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, and you can notice the background that they're inside of looks like a brain, perhaps the brain of God. His legs extending down look like the brain stem. This little small leg of an angel extending down looks like the pituitary stalk, pituitary infundibulum from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. So anyway, it's kind of cool. This is like temporal lobe, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe of the brain. Look at Eve looking at Adam saying, that's my husband? Oh my goodness. Okay, oh, here's a good quote by Arnold Toymey. The brotherhood of man presupposes the fatherhood of God. Yeah, yeah, if, if, if we're all made by God, then we're all brothers. We should be nice to each other. But if we're just random creatures by you know Darwinian evolution, then we're just talking primates, then we don't have any rights. Okay, so anyways, here's Otto Warburg. He's a biochemist. A lot of people consider him the greatest biochemist of the 1900s. He won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Hans Krebs was one of his students who discovered the Krebs cycle. Uh, he also won a Nobel Prize. Another one of his students was Walter Kempner, and he deserves a Nobel Prize, but he'll never get it because I don't want the public to know about the rice diet. Okay, so what's the Warburg effect? The Warburg effect was when a, here's a normal cell, it makes most of its energy from uh, the mitochondria, but it can do glycolysis and, you know, it sends precursors like pyruvate towards the uh, mitochondria to continue with oxidative metabolism. But anyways, when you injure the mitochondria, for example, due to hypoxia, not enough oxygen, an injured mitochondria won't work so well and might even completely die, and then your cell will run predominantly on anaerobic glycolysis. So here's the Warburg effect, and that's what happens with cancer. So you have a group of cells, he was working with human tissue culture, they're exposed to hypoxia, lack of oxygen, many of them or most of them will die but some of the cells will transform into running on anaerobic glycosity. And the thought is that they retain these primitive pathways like glycolysis that can run in hypoxic, low oxygen conditions. And so the cell is becoming more primitive, reverting to this ancient pathway buried away that some cells can still access. And that's what happens with cancer. And that's called the metabolic theory of cancer. But it's highly relevant because other cells will go into something a little bit like cancer physiology under certain conditions. <clears throat> Immune system cells will go into something akin to this when they're fighting off an infection. During embryology and rapid growth phases, cells will go into something like this. Normal cells, because you can run Krebs cycle in reverse and generate more synthetic uh, intermediates. So for biosynthesis, it is thought that cells used to run uh, Krebs cycle backwards, okay, uh, evolutionarily, you know, before oxygen was widely available in the, in the environment. So here is an example of a bacterial cell running on anaerobic glycolysis, burning glucose without oxygen. Here's a normal human cell, which is basically means a worker. It has to make tons and tons of ATP because it's just you know, working on the rail world all the live long day, okay? So that's its job. If you're a liver cell, you got a lot of work to do. You got to store glycogen, you got to break down glycogen to maintain blood glucose level. You sometimes got to run gluconeogenesis to maintain blood glucose level. You got to detox all these chemicals in the body. You got to make bile. Work, 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 work all day long. The liver is a metabolic workhouse, workhorse of the body. You need tons and tons of ATP to do that. Whereas a cancer cell is a cell that can't run its mitochondria too effectively for making energy. So instead, it pulls up more glucose. A cancer cell will typically pull up 100 times. That's 100 times more glucose than a liver cell, a normal liver cell, a normal cell. That's why the cancer cells are positive on PET scans. And so what I'm saying is this idea of mitochondrial injury transforming a cell into cancer is a really important point. That's the metabolic theory of cancer, and it's going to come up a lot. And if you want to understand cancer, you need to know that. Um, and then the reason why I showed this talk was because it also ends up being really important for understanding um, what happens to the immune system and what happens to brain cells. So I just wanted to make sure you got that point about endosymbiosis, phagocytosis of a mitochondria that survived within another bacteria, and they developed a mutually beneficial partnership. So we'll come back to this later in other lectures, but... The point of this talk was endosymbiosis giving us mitochondria.